give a pop quiz because I hate teachers that give pop quizzes. Um, I heard it was Jimmy say it last week, and I think I heard Al talk about it three weeks ago that the world doesn't seem to want to have any standard anymore. And the pop quiz is this uh, why doesn't the world want standards? I'll give you the A plus answer in a minute. It came from my wife. But why do you suppose it is that all standards are being rejected? That's a rough one, isn't it? I because they didn't think of the standard and they're saying, oh, I can't do that anyway. So when they get in and they excuse. Mm -hmm. They can't do something. They live Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Um, what I perceive the A answer is, and it came from my wife very close to what y'all are coming up with, and the, the brief story behind it. My wife was in an airplane, and she was just reading her Bible. And there was an unbeliever who sat next to her. And while my wife was just quietly reading, this woman verbally got aggressive with my wife, talking about how stupid Christianity was and how stupid Christians were and stuff like that. And my wife got a real earful on that. And as the conversation went on, they went their separate ways. My wife saw this person a little bit later in the airport and went up to her and got the typical sneer, like, oh, you again. And my wife said, uh, you know, I, I listened to you, and now it's your turn to listen to me. And in the dialogue, my wife told this woman, your problem is this. You, re you can't handle the thought of a creator who would have the audacity to minister correction and discipline to the creation. You can't handle that, which was true. And I think that's the reason why the world rejects all standards. Because what if those standards come from a creator? And what if that would indicate that there is someone that we're accountable to? This is why I think the world wants to kick off any type of restraint, because if it's a standard, it may imply that there is a supreme being who gives that standard and who has the right to actually legislate morality and, and bring discipline. So, y'all did good in a pop quiz. That's not an easy question. Last week, we took a look at a real heavy-duty piece of scripture in Jeremiah chapter 27, the Jerusalem Council, where ministers of the occult were congregated around the, G the Gentile kings, and false prophets were congregated around King Zedekiah trying to induce everybody to form this anti-Babylonian coalition, which would have been disaster if they did because God would have simply turned up the heat which he in fact did. That coalition gives you something to think about that God had sovereignly placed there. He says so. He sovereignly placed both the false prophets to the Jews as well as the ministers of the occult to the Gentiles specifically to incite them to walk in a direction that would bring the wrath of God. It's a big deal there because God puts all of his cards on the table and he says, these guys are here for a reason, don't listen to them. It's the, one of those unconditional sovereignty of God things and my takeaway from that was that the judgment of God is a false prophet who tells you there is no judgment from God. False prophets always want to give you the path of least resistance. Now, 
this council has to have fizzled out because I've never seen any evidence in the scripture that these nations formed in an anti-Babylonian coalition. And eventually, as the years go by, Zedekiah will, will become emboldened to form an alliance with Egypt. As he does, he will flip off Nebuchadnezzar and incite Nebuchadnezzar's wrath and bring disaster on himself. So this thing has to have fizzled out very, very quickly. And a follow-up to Jeremiah 27 is Jeremiah chapter 29. This letter, it's, it contains everybody's favorite verses. It's a letter that's written from, from Jerusalem to Babylon. It's written by Jeremiah, and Zedekiah himself sends it. I'm in uh, Jeremiah 29, first few verses, if you want to follow along. Zedekiah has a lot of interest in having this letter go out because this is going to convince Nebuchadnezzar that everything is happy back in Jerusalem. He doesn't have to worry about any kind of insurrection or rebellion against his, his authority. And Jeremiah is saying to the 10,000 who have been deported, look, you guys are going to be here a long time. So get comfortable. Pray for Babylon. In its welfare, you're going to have welfare. Zedekiah in verse 3 sends these letters by the absolute finest uh, of human, the finest of humanity that's available. This, this is the son of Shaphan and Hilkiah. Send this from 1 Chronicles 34. These guys, Shaphan and Hilkiah, were present when a single lost copy of the law of God was found when they were cleaning out all of Manasseh's filth that he left behind. Imagine that, one single lost copy, God's word hanging on by a thread. It happened to be found, and Shaphan and Hilkiah brought that copy of God's law to Josiah. And when he heard it, he tore his clothes, and that would bring about the greatest awakening that Israel ever had. So Zedekiah gets their sons to make dead sure this letter this progress report or report card makes it over to Nebuchadnezzar. And verses 4 to 6, look what's in this letter. This is, this is basically, uh, get comfortable. You're going to be here a long time. Learn how to be happy in Babylon letter. That's what this is about. And this is actually going to be music to Nebuchadnezzar's ears because he, do, he knows he doesn't have to worry about anything as he's absent from Jerusalem. Uh, look at verses 4 to 6. Take wives, become the father of sons and daughters. Build, plant, be fruitful, and multiply. I also think that the settlement of the Jews had to have been the result of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. There's two rivers. There's a Tigris and the Euphrates. And Babylon is right here. There's a little royal canal called the Kibar River there. That's where the Jews are settled right close to Nebuchadnezzar's palace. This makes me think that the four Hebrews who had already been there for a good, uh, you know, eight or nine years, they would take measure to make sure that the Israelites had a fairly smooth transition in Babylon. And he's saying, you're going to be there a long time. Be comfortable. Verse 7, seek the welfare of a city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will have welfare. He's letting them know that you guys are in for a do-over. You're in time out for right now. Do not listen to your prophets. We've talked about that, the prophetic poison that is circulating both in Jerusalem and in Babylon, that this exile that they said was never going to happen is now only going to last two years. And Jeremiah said, you do not want to listen to these guys. Verse 10, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. Verses 11 and 12, for I know this is everybody's favorite verse right here, and it is written to the 10,000. I know the plans that I have for you, plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. Then you'll call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You'll seek me and find me when you search for me 
with all your heart. He's letting the 10,000 know, I am not forgetting you. I have plans for you as a nation. These plans are going to be good. But right now, you're in time out. Interestingly enough, from this letter, Nebuchadnezzar will perceive Jeremiah the prophet to be an ally. Because Jeremiah is saying something that's going to be music to Nebuchadnezzar's ears. He is telling the Jews, don't think about rebellion. Don't think about coming home. Be happy. Pray for Babylon. Matter of fact, at the end of this chapter, this is where a couple of false prophets, I think, get roasted for proclaiming a different message. And Nebuchadnezzar will perceive Jeremiah to be an ally. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter 40, if you want to go ahead and check this out on your own, I'm not going to go into much detail, but at this point, Babylon just destroys Jerusalem, and those who are being taken away are all led away in chains. If you survived the siege, you were taken away in chains, and at that point, Nebuchadnezzar has sent word through the captain of his bodyguard, whose name is Nebuzaradan, and he says, look, you need to find Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is located among all those chained folks who are being led away to exile. And Jeremiah is set free. And the captain of the bodyguard says, listen, wherever you want to go, you can come to Babylon with us, you can stay here, Egypt, whatever your choice is. So uh, I guess obedience has its perks. That would be the that would be the lesson to be learned from that. Changing gears just a little bit and getting into the call of Ezekiel. This is just a year after that letter makes its way to Babylon. This is where Ezekiel gets his call. He's been in Jerusalem since 597. It's now 593, four years later, then he gets his call. And I'll be in the first three or four chapters of Ezekiel on this. Now, God follows a pattern I have observed, starts in Genesis, continues on into Exodus, in that when he gets wind of trouble on our planet, he comes down to investigate. You see it early in the book of Genesis, like... Oh, yeah, Abel's blood cries to him from the ground. So he's seen right there having a conversation with Cain. What's going on? At the Tower of Babel, God gets word that a, a, a city and a tower is being built that reaches to heaven. Man is trying to reach heaven by the strength of the right arm and the skill of the hand. God doesn't want that. So he says, let us go down there and see the city and the tower, which the sons of men have built. So he makes another appearance. He says that the outcry of Sodom has reached him when he uh, reached him from heaven. So he comes down to visit Abraham in the form of three. And two of the three say, okay, let's go down and check out what's going on in Sodom and see if it's done entirely according to its outcry. And if not, I'll know. So this is what God does. He hears something like the cry of the Israelites under Egyptian slavery. He'll hear that, and he will come down and he'll visit. So following that pattern of hearing and coming down to visit, there are three spectacular appearances of God that have to do with the outpouring of very, very serious doses of his wrath. It happened to Isaiah prior to the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel. It happens to Ezekiel as he is over in Babylon by a place called the Kibar River. And it happens again in the book of Revelation prior to the outpouring of the wrath of God we see there. This is, to me, I think what God is doing, he is, this is what I would call a judicial visit. He is seen weighing a problem 
and figuring out what his judgment is going to be. Except now, with the fall of the northern kingdom, the fall of the southern kingdom, and revelation, the tribulation period, we're looking at a much more serious dose of God's wrath. So you had this real official and scary presence of God that these guys see. And just some observations. These are from Isaiah 6, Ezekiel 1 to 4, uh, and Revelation chapter 4. And Ezekiel actually gets to see the same thing more than once. But just some observations about these three different chapters of Scripture. In two of the three <clears throat> visitations, which is going to be Ezekiel and Revelation, God is seen accompanied by the colors of the rainbow. Isn't that interesting? What I think God is doing there is keeping in mind a promise that he made to his friend Noah many, many years ago. That whatever I see when I go down there, I made a promise to Noah that I would never again bring a flood on the world. Two of the three had the colors of the, of the rainbow that are accompanying God. Ezekiel, his creatures that he speaks of, there are four that are transporting the throne of God around. Each of those four has four faces. A lion, bull, man, eagle. Sixteen faces. They also have eyes all around. In Revelation, we also get the same thing. There are Four creatures, there it's mentioned that they just have one face. Lion, calf or bull, man, and eagle. They have eyes in front and back, and around and within they have eyes. Ezekiel mentions of the four that he describes is that there's no need for these four to turn. They have eyes everywhere. So if God wants to go from here to over there, they don't turn. There is no need. They're always going forward because wherever they go, they're capable of seeing all around them. So there is no need to turn. And the thing that's, that gets me is that Isaiah's four that he saw and John's four that he saw these four are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Isaiah said, his four cry out to one another, holy, holy, holy. John said, his four are saying that day and night. And you think about that, those four living creatures that are capable of that transport the throne of God around. When you consider that they have been everywhere there is to be, and they've seen everything there is to see, it catches my attention that they can't find anything, and they can't find anyone like the one who sits on the throne. And day and night, they say, holy, holy, holy. Could you imagine being in the presence of of someone whose holiness is so far beyond description that you just, you're dumbfounded. And I can't say for sure if these four living creatures recorded three different time frames are the same or not. I don't know. Isaiah doesn't give enough details. I wish he gave more details and maybe I could make a better uh, assessment. But if the, if the ones in the book of Isaiah and the ones in the book of Revelation are the same, that means for 800 years they've been caught in a sense of awe. And they can't find anything else to say. Could you imagine God's holiness keeping you in suspended awe for 800 years? I wonder what it's like to, to see that. Now some stupid doctors are telling me I might see that first. Maybe I'll, I'll let you know. But, um, you know, 
God's holy. I mean, we think of heaven as a, as a reunion of loved ones. Maybe I'll get to see David, and we can ask Saul some questions if he's there. Saul is, is a lot of questions to ask Saul if he's there. But, and, and maybe that's all Maybe that's all true, I don't know. But what if God's holiness is so incredibly infinite that it's capable of just keeping you in suspended awe for 800 years? We don't know anything about that. That's just, that's strange to us. But I think it's a real likelihood when I consider these four living creatures. These four facial characteristics also catch people's attention. Lion, bull, or calf, man, eagle. And the characteristics of those animals are very interestingly, interestingly close to the characteristics of Christ that are presented in each of the four Gospels. Matthew's trying to present to his crowd Jesus as the king of the Jews always quoting from the Old Testament, always saying as it is written. He's quoting from what the Jews would consider authoritative. He's trying to build the case that Jesus is actually the Lion of Judah. So one of those beasts is a lion. The bull that Ezekiel says, or the calf that John says, that is a service type of animal that provides milk, it provides meat. You can hook it up to a threshing floor and it'll thresh your grain all day long. You can put a yoke on it, you can plow. It's an animal that serves. Well, Mark's gospel is targeting the Romans. These guys are not going to be impressed with things that Jesus said or his teaching. So Mark is an abbreviated gospel. But Mark is a super fast-moving gospel. It's, he's always using the word immediately, going from one to the other to the other, to show that Christ is always in service. And there's demonstrations of the power of Christ and the fact that he is a servant. And in the gospel of Mark, he's presented as the perfect servant. So you have the calf or the bull. Luke, that's the gospel to folks like us the Gentile. That's where Jesus Christ calls himself the Son of Man by his favorite title so many times. That's reflective of the man that is of the four living creatures. And the eagle. If, if someone were to say to you, you know, up in the sky, there's a crow up there, you probably wouldn't think much of that. Or an egret, eh, not too much of that. Nice bird, good hunters, that's it. But if someone says, look up there, there's an eagle. First thing you're going to do, at least first thing I do, is I want to look up. Do I, see, do I see white in the front and in the back? Whoa, that's an eagle. Eagle makes you want to look up. And just the sense of awe about that bird is mildly reflective of some of the honor and majesty that's due Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John. John presents Jesus as not only God the Son, but the Son of God. Man as well as God, fully man, fully God. Tough for us to get our heads around that. Or that's something we have to do by faith as best we can. But the eagle makes you want to look up. John's target is all of humanity to try to present Jesus Christ as a son of God. And the awe of Christ makes you want to do like the eagle. You want to look up. Approaching Ezekiel, and this is to give this guy, oh, unbelievable. I, I just don't do well on time sometimes. Uh, approaching Ezekiel to equip him to do the mo most difficult ministry, I think, in all of the scripture. I mean, this guy has got it tough. I don't know if even Paul is going to have it tougher than Ezekiel. But 
Ezekiel is approached by, I guess maybe I would just say the essence of holiness, the essence of a consuming fire. He's the only guy in the scripture that I know actually is approached by consuming fire. And it starts, let me see where I am here if you want to follow along. It's, this is, yeah, I think it's going to be in chapter one. The guy takes an entire chapter to describe God. You imagine that's a tall order, trying to describe God. You can tell he's at a loss for words. He's always saying, I saw something like this, and it kind of looked like this. I saw this, and it kind of looked like this. He's trying to use his verbiage to explain an infinite thing. And God appears to him out of a storm cloud. There is wheels. There are wheels within wheels that have eyes all around. There are four living creatures. Each of these has four faces bunch of eyes. There are coals of fire or stones of fire there. There's an expanse and then above the expanse is one seated on a throne. This is I, I, the word taxi came to me and that's an inappropriate word. This is the mechanism. I wish I had a better word than that. This is the mechanism by which the almighty Trans, uh, goes from place to place and he describes their wings like the sound of abundant waters like the sound of an army camp whenever they fly and this one who is on the throne at the end of verse 2 extends to Ezekiel a scroll And written on this scroll, chapter 2, verse 10, are lamentations, mourning, and woe. This is a record of tears, but you don't really know whose tears they are. He's given instruction, chapter 3, verse 1, to eat what he finds, to eat this scroll, and then go speak. He eats the scroll, it is sweet in his mouth. And then God says to him, son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. And suddenly the light comes on. You realize this is a record of tears. Lamentation, mourning, and woe. But these are tears that are shed by the Almighty himself over the spiritual condition of Jerusalem. And what I learned from that is that Ezekiel was capable of speaking for God only after he had touched and come in contact with the heart of God. Now Ezekiel is going to have the tallest order of just about anybody in the Bible because this is a people that refuses the words of the prophets. We've been over that in 2 Chronicles 36. They hate guys who speak to them. They despise and they scoff and they mock. Add to that the fact that this people feels that because they're genetically connected to Abraham or geographically connected to Israel or ritualistically connected to a building, they think that everything is peachy dandy between them and God kind of like a lot of folks today, feeling like if I'm associated with a building, if I'm associated with religious practice, everything is totally okay between me and the Almighty. Matter of fact, even in the New, into the New Testament, the deception about the genetic connection of Abraham, this is going to give Jesus and John a hard time even in the New Testament. People think, oh, I'm genetic, genetically connected to Abraham. I'm, you know, what do I need you for? placing their confidence in the lineage. So add to that the fact that they re refuse prophets who speak. God is now going to send them a prophet who cannot speak. This is just the genius of God. And Ezekiel is going to be required to act out some really, really excruciatingly difficult stuff. And people are going to ask him what's going on. And then if the Almighty opens his mouth, because his mouth is locked, 
if God opens his mouth, he's permitted to give an explanation. So you're looking at a very, very humiliating and embarrassing ministry where this guy is going to become a visible uh, display case of the wrath of God. If you want to know what is going to be happening in Jerusalem, all you have to do is take a look at the life of Ezekiel and see what he's acting out. Uh, got one minute left. Anybody got any uh, observations or thoughts or anything? A dense package again tonight. Cool. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, I can do a little. Let me see. I can do a little. Um, I know what I could do. This is a day. This is from Ezekiel chapter 4. This is a day in the life of Ezekiel, chapter 4 and chapter 5. Okay, so you're settled in Babylon. And you've through the help of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you've kind of learned to get a menial task. A little later on, you'll learn Chaldean, and maybe you'll advance to a, a, a trade that's a little bit more along lines of where you're suited to make more money. So you're going to work one day, and you happen to notice a bunch of flies that are congregated around a window. You don't pay much attention to it. You go home at night, there's more flies. And and I still don't pay attention to it until about three or four days go by. Then you start really smelling some nasty stuff. Finally, after a few more days, you get the courage. Your curiosity overwhelms you, and you get the courage to look inside that window, and you get to see what's going on in there. And you see, to your horror, a very, very difficult scene. There's a guy staked to the ground, tied up so he can't move around. There's a, a pile of, of horse manure up here. Over here, some rocks and maybe a couple iron sticks where he can stick some horse manure under there, light it, have some food. Over here, there's this brick, and he's really mad at this brick. He, he writes on the brick, Jerusalem. And then he starts acting out with some small stick figures, matchbox type stuff, things that are happening in Jerusalem. He's got tents made up over here. He's got where soldiers would camp. He has against this, this brick a miniature battering ram. And he has an iron plate that is set up between him and the city. You've never seen anything like this. And, and you go in the window and you say, Sir, are you okay? And suppose the guy can't answer you. That's a day in the life of Ezekiel. He is only allowed to answer in the event God supernaturally moves on him and he's able to give the literal, inspired, inerrant word of God in prophetic fashion. He's not like Jeremiah. Jeremiah back home in Jerusalem, he's capable of reasoning with people and trying to persuade them, not Ezekiel. But it wouldn't have worked if God had a prophet like Jeremiah in Babylon. The people had already demonstrated they don't want anything to do with a prophet who speaks, so God gives them a prophet who can't speak, the genius of God.